Um, Ezekiel is a prophet of the Old Testament before Jesus. Um, he was a prophet to the nation of Israel. Um, during the time of the book of Ezekiel, um, he's between 30 to 50 years old. Um, Israel has been taken into captivity. They've gone into exile um, under the Babylonians. Um, and about within the first five years, so within the timeline of the book, Jerusalem is um, not only laid under siege, but then destroyed um, and its temple as well um, during this time. So if you are coming also to Venice Church, you might, might be um, connecting some of the dots that in, in our service, we've been talking about the book of Nehemiah, and that's the rebuilding of the, the walls of Jerusalem. And so we're sort of, moved, we've moved back now a little ways to where those walls have been destroyed. Um, and Ezekiel is a prophet that talks to Israel about um, their sins, how they've abandoned God, how they've profaned his name among, among the nations. Um, and so there's definitely a, like a pro proclamation of God's judgment on his people, um, but also loving discipline. And so the, the book begins with a lot of what God is promising to do as in terms of judgment and punishment. Um, but the, the book also moves toward the hope that Israel can continue to have in God, how God is going to restore them, um, restore the nation, restore the land that they're living in, um, so that they will know that he is God, but the nations will also be able to know that he is God. Um, so specifically tonight, we're going to be in Ezekiel 36, 22. So if you want to turn there, I'm going to read it. It's going to be a little bit of a long passage, and 36, 36 oh, 30. verse 22. Um, yeah, chapter 36, verse 22. Um, I'm going to try and give it its due. Uh, there's, a, there's a particular verse in this passage that really spoke to me when I was, I want to say, like in between a senior high school and a freshman in college. Um, that's how God is promising his people. I will take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Um, and I remember um, being in a really dark season um, during that time of my life, feeling really weighed down by my own sins, uh, aware of my unworthiness, um, in some ways even hopeless and feeling kind of dead in my heart. Like I seared my conscience with um, my lifestyle and um, was having a hard time feeling alive to the things of God, to um, things in general, mm -hmm. I might have been going through a, a little bit of a depression. Um, so that verse was like my hope during that season of my life, that God would take my heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh. Um, and I, I was, uh, I remember I, I went on this trip to Brazil um, on a short-term missions trip. And in one of the cities, we got a t-shirt uh, from a camp that we were helping at. And I didn't know what it said at the time, but oh it goodness. was in Portuguese and it was translated that exact version. Um, so just reflecting on how like God's loved me in different um, parts of my life, uh, just getting to reflect on that part of my life in particular still amazes me how God was able to meet me where I was mm -hmm. despite the hardness in my heart mm -hmm. and the darkness that I was in, uh, that he was faithful um, to me for his own sake. Um, so now that I go back to the passage, I don't know if you've had this experience before, but sometimes we cling on to a passage that might show up on our Instagram feed because it hits hard and it sounds amazing uh, on its own. But then you read the context and you're like, hmm, there's a lot more here to wrestle with. And this is definitely one of those passages because surrounding God's promise to Israel about giving them this part of flesh is some kind of severe things so um yeah just praying that um tonight that we would um love how god is committed to his own name and we enjoy um that that is actually the best thing for us mm -hmm. and it's something it's a hope for us in our kind of this place yeah. um, just as there's hope for me as there's a job so yeah, Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 22. Um, I have a ESV translation. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, 
Thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. And I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. And I will summon the grain um, and make it abundant and lay, lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant, that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. And you will loathe yourselves for your iniquities and your abominations. It is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Yeah. All right. Um, there, there are so many different ways I want to approach talking about this passage, but I'm sure just like reading it, you can't deny how much God returns to like this point that he's making to his people. It's not for your sake. It's not for your sake. Yeah. It's for my name's sake. Okay. <laughs> the name that you profane among the nations. Um, That's right. But if you remove all the, 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 those statements that God makes about how it's um, for his sake that he's going to act, everything else he talks about is just only benefit for the people of Israel. Yeah. So he's telling Israel, like, I'm going to do all these great things for you, around you, in you. Um, so from that perspective, there's so much of God's love for his people in yeah. this passage. Um, and yet it looks like that love is not merely rooted in God finding anything lovely or worthy about his people, Israel, yeah. um, but rather God's love for and zeal for his own Lord. No worries. <laughs> it's totally fine. Um, so I think I, I linked to the person, Brittany, leading um, the Zoom to a YouTube video. Um, I wanted to just show you guys a kind of contrast. Um, and so I was, I found this on YouTube. Um, and I don't know how much I need to explain it, except to say it's kind of one of these, like, I want to be encouraging and want to help you guys love yourselves sort of video and it's supposed to be soothing and something that like is positively affirming. So that's the spirit of the video and wanted to play it up against the passage that we just read. So if Brittany, if you wanted to play that, we'll listen to like a couple minutes of it. Hello, my love. Welcome to Guided Affirmations by Lavender. Today, we will be reprogramming our mind with powerful affirmations for self-love, self-confidence, and self-worth. Affirmations help create new thought patterns in our mind. Through repeated listening and reciting, you can create new neural pathways in your brain, building new positive thought patterns and breaking any negative patterns you may have. Listen to this audio every day for 21 days as your daily morning affirmations or in the evenings right before you sleep. I will repeat each affirmation twice and then give you time to repeat after me. Feel free to recite these affirmations in your mind or out loud. I accept myself exactly as I am. I accept myself exactly as I am. I 
I respect myself. I respect myself. I love and embrace all of me. I love and embrace all of me. Alright, we can cut it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so it goes on for 14 minutes. Oh, gotcha. um, but I, I just like even hearing the first sort of affirmation she wants us to speak over ourselves. There's something in me that just like cries out, like, I don't know, like fake or there's something that is just so contrary in in her faith. It, I, I see it as a faith, not in God, but in herself. Um, and there's a like this desperate, not it doesn't sound desperate, it's soothing and gentle, but it's this um, desire to make peace with everything that we are. Um, and to do away with all shame and guilt um, and bad feelings toward ourselves um, just by way of speaking this new truth that we're trying to wire into our brains. Um, and this gospel is just folly. And, um, and, and I hope that the, the contrast between that and this passage sort of makes that clear. Um, and one of my hopes for this series, How He Loves, is to distinguish how God's love is not what this world thinks love is. Um, yeah. And for us to, as best as we can as teachers, um, to, to, to clarify for you what love is, mm -hmm. which is also clarifying to you who God is. Um, yeah. yeah, and so, one of the things that I find helps me believe in God is how um, he doesn't deny reality, um, right. deny reality who we are. And I, I think the video that we were just watching is very denying of brokenness and sin, mm -hmm. um, tries to ignore that it's a part of the picture. Um, and I think there's a particular kind of person, maybe in a particular kind of season, who is more able to be deceived and, and receive that. Um, but I think there are per particular seasons of my life, and maybe yours as well, um, where you are so confronted with your own despicableness that, that you cannot possibly accept what she has to say. Um, and it's in that place that God still loves us and dies for the ungodly. Right. Um, and so when we when we have found ourselves in the past, when we find ourselves in the darkest of places, um, it's God's commitment to his own glory that is our hope. Um, and so really tonight, I that is like my audience. Um, it is people who are having a hard time hoping. Um, yeah. And, and they might be receiving encouragements from the, from their friends, like, oh, things aren't that bad, just believe in yourself, like, and things will get better, you know? Right. And they're so hopeless that they can't be encouraged or affirmed by thinking those things. Um, and they feel stuck in this hopeless, dark, simple, even place. Um, and that was the place that I found myself when God originally brought this word into my life when um, I was between high school and college. And there's something that gives you hope when you realize God is also saying that I am broken, sinful, despicable, wicked. Um, and it's not on my ability to pick myself up out of that situation. Yeah. Um, and the fact that his love for me is not rooted in me, but it's in him, yeah. um, is really the only kind of gospel that was able to reach me um, mm -hmm. when I was in that place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's go back through the passage. Um, I almost kind of just want to count on the one hand, um, how much God is iterating, reiterating that it's for his own glory. Yeah. Um, and That's then right. on the other hand, 
how beneficial and how loving that is toward us, how that is exactly what we need um, and how that is good news for us. Um, maybe one brief note. This, this does take place in a particular context. Um, so I wanna be careful um, to draw generalizations from it in a way that's trustworthy. Um, because, because Israel was in, in a very um, wicked place. So the way that God talks to his people here isn't the way that God talks to his people throughout all scripture. Um, and so I think it takes some discernment to see like what is happening in this conversation between God and his people in this passage how does that reflect on his character and how does his character translate to maybe where we are today in our relationship with him? How is Christ involved in that um, translation? Um, so I want to do it carefully um, and just ask that you would do the same. Um, anything else you want to say about that? Um, Maybe one of the ways that I think about this passage is the Old Testament's pretty long if you've read through it. Um, and a lot of the accounts of Israel is how God delivers them, how God promises great things for them, um, shows them his glory and his power and his love for them, and their just amazing ability to turn away from him every time. Um, and to abandon him and to, to not to obey his commandments, to do exactly the things that, that God tells him not to do. Um, and so currently I'm also reading through, um, is the Israelites leaving um, Egypt many, many years before, um, generations before, um, how God delivered them from Egypt with such amazing signs um, that you would think this people must have an amazing sight of who God is. And, and yet they grumble and complain. They don't believe. He takes them right up to this land that he's promised them. And, and they look at the land and they're like, we can't take, we can't take this land. You know, we see my like grasshoppers to the, these people and we're grasshoppers in our own eyes. And God's like, have you not seen what I've just done for you um, and how able I am to bring you into the promises I have for you? Um, and, it, and, and so because of Israel's lack of faith in God, um, he takes them out into the wilderness to die. Um, and yet he has this promise for the new generation um, and how he's going to be faithful to them and bring them into the promised land. Uh, and so you, you see this time and time again. Um, so in a sense, there's this kind of built up um, judgment that Israel um, is like caring for itself or herself. And, uh, and, and God is very merciful and slow to anger and patient and loving. And so I, I want us to look at this passage knowing that there's a whole history of God's uh, loving kindness and patience towards Israel. Um, but that there is like another aspect of him that you can't deny. Like you said last week that God is a God of justice. Um, and, and in this passage in particular, with God's talking about his name's sake, there's also this sense that God was wanting Israel to be um, the way that the other nations knew who God was. Um, and so by Israel disobeying God, um, his punishment for them was to go into exile. His desire for them was to repent and to be holy as they go out into exile, to be disciplined into righteousness. Mm -hmm. And there's almost a, a, an opportunity there that when Israel is scattered, that the other nations would see them and know who God is. Um, but instead, they don't repent of their wickedness. And so when the people of God are scattered, um, the other nations see this kind of wicked, um, evil people. 
um, who are just as they are. Um, and that reflects on God. Um, it's the, the part of um, the Corinthians ex description of love that it reminds me of is how love never fails. Um, and there's almost like this critique of God when his people is, is a wicked people, which is God has your love failed. Um, because look at this people, they are not consecrated to you, they're not pure, uh, they don't obey you. Um, they're, they're in famine and they're, and they're scattered. Um, and it can look as though God's love has failed them. Um, and God really wants to know, not wants Israel, not just Israel to know um, his love, but all the nations. Um, okay, so let's go back to the passage. Uh, starting in verse 22 again. Um, Therefore say the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. Um, so there's that, that explanation of how the people of Israel have gone out to different nations. And instead of being a light in those dark places, they have profaned God's name in those places. Um, and, and so God says, and I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, um, which has been profane among the nations and which you have profaned among them. Um, one of the passages in the New Testament, and one of the ways that you ought to test whether this passage can be generalized is how consistent is it with the rest of scripture? Like, does God love his own glory in the way he does in this passage in the rest of scripture. Mm -hmm. And I think about um, the way that Jesus taught us to pray. And he said, um, our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And that, that phrase, God, may your, you can think of it as may your name be regarded as holy, mm -hmm. um, hallowed be thy name. And so that is so central and foundational to the way that Jesus wants us to pray to God. Um, and it's very central and integrated and why God acts the way he does, including in this passage, when he says, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. Um, okay, so moving on. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. Um, so there's a promise that even though right now Israel is scattered, and in exile, that he's going to bring them together again. Um, I will sprinkle clean water on you. Um, and so one of the themes of Ezekiel, um, he was of the priestly class. So he, he's in exile in Babylon. But if the temple were running and he were in Jerusalem, he would likely have been a priest between the ages of 30 and 50. That was kind of considered the ter your term as a priest. Um, so it's interesting that instead of serving as a priest in the temple, um, he's exiled, but he's, he serves his term um, telling Israel what God is saying. Um, but there's a lot of this emphasis on how uh, God wants us to be clean. Uh, some, a lot of references to ritual purity here. Um, but yeah, so all that to say, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. Um, there, God has said countless times before this to his people, telling them to, to leave the idols that they're worshiping and to serve God only. Um, so kind of want to hold that up together with God now eventually saying, like, I'm going to cleanse you from your idols. Um, it's almost like the, the, the people of Israel are, they are proving their, their incapacity to do what God tells them to do and to serve him only um, and to love him with all their hearts. Um, and so it's, it's almost requiring that God do more. It's like, okay, you, you can't do this for yourself. I will do it for you. Um, And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. 
Um, I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Mm. Um, that's definitely like a, a, a word that I wrestle with a little bit or that sticks out to me. Like God is going to cause his people to obey his statutes. Um, there's something wonderful about that for the, those of us who desire to obey God's statutes yeah. and we find ourselves just like tragically incapable of it yeah. that God would tell us, well, I will cause you to walk in my statutes um, and to be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God and I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. Um, so in, in the history of Israel, we're seeing how God delivers them over and over again from the situations that they're in. Um, and yet what God really desires is that they would be delivered from their uncleanness and their impurity. And um, they're chasing after other gods um, and idolizing anything but God. Um, so, yeah, I, I like that, that you see it in scripture that like God almost, he does these external physical um, examples of deliverance um, to show what he wants to do in each of our hearts and in his, his people's hearts. He wants to deliver them from their uncleanness. And the same sort of battle that you see take place um, in Egypt between Pharaoh's hardening of heart and God's signs and wonders and that back and forth and the intense struggle, um, that is like a physical representation of the struggle that we go through to be clean and to be delivered from our uncleanness. Um, and it's, I believe it's more amazing for, of a testimony um, to see how God delivers us from our hopeless, dead, uncleanness. Um, yeah, so I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. And I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine on you. And this is another theme throughout the book of Ezekiel where it's sort of like there's there's a there's a cleanness that God does in our hearts, um, accomplishes in us. And it doesn't stop there, but it pours from that place out. And um and there's so much like uh, symbolic speaking of how the land is healed and the waters are made clean and brought to life. Um, and so there's a vision that Ezekiel has later in the book where there's this water flowing from a new temple and a new Jerusalem that, um, that pours out and goes into the Dead Sea, which is called the Dead Sea because it's so full, full of salt and nothing can live there. And it makes the Dead Sea um, alive and fresh um, and teeming with life. So you can kind of see that story play out in the way that Ezekiel talks when he's describing how God is going to cleanse his people. It doesn't stop there because it says, it talks about how he's going to summon the grain, make it abundant, uh, make the fruit of the tree increase in the field abundant. Um, and then he comes back to why, like that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. Um, and yeah, it just it sounds like a really good um, positive story up to this point. And 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 then and then he goes back to this talking about how like you will remember your evil ways. Um, so God, God's love for His people is not blind to their failings and doesn't want them to those failings to be lost on them. I don't know exactly how to describe it, but the parallel I was making in my mind is like, it's sort of the way that a father or, or mother might love their kid um, when, the, when the child is disobedient and the, the, the parents want to be merciful and kind and loving, but it, they don't want the, the kid, they don't want to, um, what's the word, maybe like, enable the kid to continue in their bad behavior. Yeah. Um, so, so God is the same way with his people. He doesn't, 
he doesn't want them to think like, oh, God is doing all these great things in us and around us. Um, like, all must be well. Um, but going back to what Abel was speaking of a couple of weeks ago, that God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. Um, that's exactly what you see happening here. Um, that God is going to be extremely kind to his people, but his desire is for them, for that to have this effect on them where they will remember just how evil they are. Um, and some of the language is just so opposite from our like self-esteem culture um, yeah. that you will loathe yourselves for your iniquities and your abominations. Um, it reminds me of how Jesus says, like, if you, if you don't hate your mother, brother more, um, or even your own life, um, you're not worthy of me. Um, and so there's a sense in which God wants us to, to see everything in, in ourselves um, through a, like a real lens rather than a rosy colored glasses lens. Yeah. Um, and he wants to hate what is um, gross in us, right. um, in ourselves. And then goes on to say, it's not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Um, confounded, I think it means like amazed, confused, like kind of flabbergasted. I don't know if that's like a more clear word, but it's like, um, yeah, that because we read, we see it when we read the story of Israel. How how amazing it is that that Israel is so just um, rebellious towards God, despite his loving kindness toward them, right. despite how much he reveals himself to them. Yeah. Um, and so he wants them to be that kind of confounded, amazed with themselves. Um, and I think God calls us to be that way toward ourselves too. I think of that, um, the passage where Paul is talking about how he does the very things he hates to do. Um, and there's a kind of like, like confounded in the way that um, Paul is talking there. And he's just kind of amazed at how um, splintered we are in our souls. Um, all right, well, that's sort of the end of the passage. Um, I want to kind of move us into conversations with each other around this topic. Um, I kind of think of it as a way I want to close this out. Um, Uh, one of the things I was just reflecting on, just reading the passage over and over again, and I hope it was helpful for you to have gone through it just a couple of times, um, is that God doesn't love us according to our worthiness, yeah. but according to his character. Amen. Um, and, and that is consistent with all scripture. And so there are just an innumerable number of verses that come to mind, but I think about how... Um, God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were sinners, he died for us. Sure. Um, and so there's that amazing quality of God's love that uh, maybe some of us would die for someone righteous, but God God shows how um, perfect his love is that he would be willing to die for us even while we were, we were still sinners. And so God's commitment to us isn't tethered to um, anything good in us. Um, and, and really what you see God's commitment to in, in his people of Israel and in that passage is he's committed to the decision he made to choose them. Sure. Um, and so he he's wanting to show himself to be who he is, uh, which is kind of a circular statement. But God is faithful and true to his promises. Um, his love never fails. Um, he's perfectly merciful and just and holy, and he is perfectly committed to displaying that um, in the way he loves his people. Um, and so even when they completely give themselves away to idols um, and, and they become worthless according to what they worship. Uh, that's another thing that I've been thinking about is that um, the sort of self-esteem culture 
likes it wants people to realize their own work just in their own innate work um, but part of the way that scripture talks about our work is that um when we when we worship other gods and give ourselves um over to other things we we become worthless like those other things are um and so our our work is really drawn from from what we worship um so before we were worth anything god chose us um, and he was faithful to us to make us his um and that's where we end up finding our work there's no room for boasting when we when we see that we have worked again um, because it's completely derivative of how god loved us despite us uh -huh. um so definitely a, a message for any of us who are feeling hopeless um that that i i see how that can put you in a place where there are so many messages that might be encouraging to other people but can't reach you because um they're just not sturdy enough um to try and convince somebody accept yourself for who you are just um love everything about yourself like those statements are they don't rest on anything strong enough um to really give a person who's in that darkness hope um but i found that this is like god the god of scripture and the god that we worship like sees our situation exactly as it is um exactly how hopeless and dead of a place that we live in apart from him um and so yeah that, and that same god gives us hope and he doesn't leave us in that in that place so one of the themes in ezekiel is how god um brings the death the dead to life um it's sort of a a new creation kind of theme um that god created us as it's talked about in genesis and we um, we abandoned him and gave ourselves over to sin which 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 produces death um and then god in christ in us creates again um, something new takes that part of stone gives us a heart of flesh um so i think it can really give us hope in the darkest of places yeah. um if you were to were to consider not even just for yourself places in your own heart but also around you people around you um, your hope for them is not based in kind of things you see in them that might give you a clue that they would be open to receiving the gospel uh, because a, a dead person is a dead person um, and unable to come to christ but god is faithful to the ones who, who he calls um, and so that that's uh just as abel was sharing a couple weeks ago like that that is what motivates us in our um, evangelism and our discipleship is is not that we see like we can imagine how somebody else would receive the gospel um, because it takes a miracle it's like the ultimate miracle is that um, a dead heart um, would wake up and receive the gospel and be brought to life um, and that's what god has done in each of our hearts um, so yeah definitely considering those dark and hopeless places in us around us um and um yeah i, I think the, the second part of the message is for all of us um it's kind of a humbling message um humility is like an interesting thing to consider with what we talked about tonight because one of the things you might wrestle with when you think about how much God loves his own glory is like, it's kind of, it can strike you as strange or proud or arrogant that God is so like gung ho about his own glory and his own name. Um, and, and yet called us to be humble. Um, like it would be wrong for any of us to love our name as much as God loves his name. Yeah. Um, so, but, but it sort of returns to like humility not being about, um, I've heard different quotes like humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Um, just like, yeah, so sometimes we, we equate humility with just reducing the like 
the value of, of the way we see ourselves. Um, but humility is really like unfogging our glasses to be, be able to see ourselves and to see others and to see God as they truly are. Um, and so for God, he is utterly unique and holy. Um, and, and so like, I'm trying to draw a parallel, like, uh, like for sometimes you see a professional athlete get really arrogant and like mm -hmm. proud of their accomplishment. Like I'm the best uh, I'm a golfer, so I'm Tiger Woods. I'm the best golfer in the world, and and uh, and maybe you see somebody in that position of arrogance, and you're like, well, you know, your talent and your accomplishments are derivative of of your talent, even your hard work. Um, you can't lay claim to that, even that's from God. Um, so all of our all the things we might be tempted to boast in are derivative of God, um, but God is in and of himself and, yeah. and, um, and deserving of, of all the credit um, and glory. And so for him, it's actually appropriate that he would hold his name up um, for people to see and for that name to be hallowed. Um, and, and it is like the best news for us. Um, and so for him to let his name be profaned and forgotten um, is actually removing like the light and life in this world. Hmm. Um, so I want us to like not dichotomize God's glory with um, how much He loves us, but it's really God, God's commitment to His own glory and holding His name up for us that is is perfectly integrated with His love for us. That's right, um, and it's exactly what we need. Yeah. So I hope some of that was helpful. Yes. Um, and helps us to like see God clearly and see ourselves soberly, um, to be encouraged to have hope, not in anything we would see in ourselves, but in the God who loves his own name. Um, mm -hmm. So let me close this in prayer and we can go into you. So Father, thank you for your word. Um, thank you that it's so unlike what, um, what the world thinks love is. Um, thank you that it's real that it um yeah that it doesn't deny or it's not deceived uh, it doesn't put on rosy colored tinted glasses god but um it looks right into the way things actually are um and and we can do that we can live in um a right way of seeing because we know that even in this real um dead dark um, sinful wicked uh space and heart that we see in ourselves that we have hope in you yes. um, a god who will take our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh yes, I'm sure. so i pray um, i pray that that you would continue to do that work in me and in all of us god um would you bring us to life um, and we admit that we are completely incapable and undeserving and, and we are not worthy of anything that you do for us, God. Um, so I pray that, that you would use this passage tonight to give us hope and to encourage us. Also, if any of us are seeking um, the repentance that you describe at the end of the passage, uh, that your kindness for your people Israel was meant to get them to a place of realizing their, their own evil. Um, and God, we know that that is part of the process um, through which you sanctify us. So I pray that your kindness would have that effect in our hearts too, um, to, see, to help us see um, exactly uh, what's evil and broken about us, um, not in a way that would um, despair us, God, because we have hope in you. So we lift all this up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So I have three questions. Um,